So you guys already know all about relativity because uh, you'll be walking down the street and you'll look into the zoo and you'll be like, dang, that is a fat walrus. And it's sitting here with its two eyes and its big horns and maybe some hair and stuff. But then you look right next to it and suddenly you're like, well, that first walrus, maybe it wasn't quite as fat as I had thought because that is a fat walrus. And you know that you can't judge a walrus until you've seen its mother. So this is a fat walrus. And this walrus, although compared to humans, it is a fat walrus. It's also a walrus compared to humans, and this guy is a fat walrus compared to other walruses. So relativity is all about that. And I want you to think about Einstein as a small, as a small boy. Now, Einstein's a good looking guy. He's like, wee, with this crazy hair, right? Like the ultimate scientist. Einstein is sitting around thinking, like most small boys, he's like, hey dad, what if I could ride on a beam of light? What would life be like if I could ride on a beam of light. But unfortunately, his dad was not around. Absent fathers. And so he was unfortunately working as a Swiss patent clerk in 1905. And in 1905, he published this paper. It was actually three papers all in one. And in that year, he did more for science. This is Albert Einstein here. More for science in one paper, okay, three papers than most respected scientists do in their entire life. Than most scientists. Wow. Yeah, so it helps if you're fantastically brilliant, but the other key to science is you have to think like a small child. You have to wonder things. You have to say, how come? And what if? Stuff like that. Good. So I hope that you're doing those things. So Einstein had two big things to say. One, he said there's equivalence. There are some other things that Einstein said that we're not ready to address yet. But we're going to talk in particular about something called special relativity. And his first statement was equivalence. He said that every law of physics is the same for every inertial reference frame. <clears throat> so this is our first statement of equivalence. Uh, <clears throat> if F equals MA. Now this statement says that Newton's laws are in full operation. So an object with no net force on it does not, excuse me, does not accelerate. <clears throat> that would be the case in an inertial reference frame. If you're in an inertial reference frame, then all physical observations. Dang, what do you mean? Temperature, light, sound, all physical observations are the same. So I guess what I'm saying is if I lock you in a room and all you know is F is MA, you can't tell whether you're moving or not because you can't tell how anything else is because every physical observation is the same as if you were not moving. And so then we need to ask some fundamental questions about like, what does it even mean to move? But we can put those off for a little bit. <clears throat> My next statement is that this is an inertial reference frame. What's a non-inertial reference frame? Can you consider a thing in which uh, a, a reference frame, a perspective on the world in which things accelerate even though there's no net force on them? Sure I can. Let's consider a reference frame where you're on a merry-go-round and uh, okay, so there's these things on the edges that go up like this and a thing here and a thing here and an axis in the middle and if you're standing here on the merry-go-round and you are looking at the world from your perspective right there, you know that everything that doesn't have a net force on it will be, I mean, what, sort of flying this direction or this direction or this direction or that direction. It will leave the merry-go-round path because a net force is required to keep things in that circular motion. So the key is, this is non-inertial. It is a non-inertial reference frame because it is accelerating. 
and we're not going to consider non-inertial reference frames because those are too general. We're gonna consider the special case which leads us, leads us to special relativity. The special case of only considering non-inertial reference frames. All right, check the camera. Everybody ready? All right, here we go. I want you to consider Einstein's second big statement. Number two, Einstein says the speed of light is the same for every observer. Uh, assuming they're in inertial reference frames. This may not come as much of a surprise because you've been told things like speed of light is the speed limit of the universe and when you were a little kid you were like I'm gonna go as fast as the speed of light because uh, that was cool, right? But I want you to consider this. I want you to consider a train and the train is bound for London. Yeah, you're in Great Britain because I think Monty Python said it best. We are all Britons. What's up Great Britain? Thank you for watching. But if you're on a train Let's link these cars together, huh? If you're on a train bound for London and you throw a baseball that way at, I don't know, 17 meters per second, then the baseball is going that way at 17 meters per second. And what if the train is also going 17 meters per second? An observer over here, oh, it's all about the observers. So this guy right here says, wow, because he sees that baseball going 34 meters per second. That's the speed of the ball as seen by me. Wow, he thinks it's 34 meters per second. But this guy says, oh yeah, here's what he says. He says the speed of the ball as seen by me is what? Well, 17 meters per second, but that's all well and good. That means that the ultimate speed of the ball is probably some combination of whether the train's moving or not. But consider what Einstein's saying, the speed of light. Now, light's a very special thing. The speed of light is the same for every observer in any inertial reference frame. But Hold up, isn't that, doesn't that have to be the case? Because if you're in an inertial reference frame, all the laws of physics have to hold. So for instance, all of Maxwell's equations, remember Maxwell's equations govern the propagation of light. Maxwell's equations are part of, oh, so this is a result of that equivalence statement that every inertial reference frame has the same physical laws in place. If Maxwell's equations are in place, then the speed of light has to be the same for every observer in an inertial reference frame. So let's consider a guy down here shining a flashlight. It's actually an enormous flashlight. Here it is. It's this huge flashlight. I mean, electric torch. Okay, Great Britain. And then um, you're going to shine this flashlight and light's gonna come out. Let's say it's seafoam green light coming out of the flashlight. That would be a nice flashlight, right? And the observer who just turned on that flashlight is standing over here, keeping an eye on that light and saying things like, wow, that light, the light, is the speed of light. Nobody's surprised at that, of course. But suddenly, the guy who just said wow now says double wow because a spaceship zooms by. Here it is, ready for it? Let's draw a, a spaceship. And the spaceship probably has this other fin this direction, and maybe it's got windows here and some seats in the back for other people to ride on the spaceship. And the spaceship, this guy says, dang, that spaceship is going, wait, 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 this guy observes, he says the speed of the spaceship is 0 0.9 times the speed of light. That spaceship is going really, really fast, right? It's like, pew, 
0.9 C, and this stuff is actually going C because it's light, so it has to go at the speed of light, but there are people on the spaceship, and the people on the spaceship see that light also. And you're thinking, well, I guess they're gonna see that light going at 10% of the speed of light, 0 0.1 times C. No, that's wrong, Einstein says that these guys see this light going at the same speed as this guy sees that light. All right, you're just gonna have to deal with that for a little bit. Let's propose that this guy also has a flashlight. So here it is, this guy has a flashlight and this guy knows, see the observer on the ground, knows that the spaceship is going 0 0.9 times the speed of light, but this guy's got a flashlight on the front and it's shining out some light here, I mean an electric torch, and it's a blue light, who cares about the color, right? It's got a blue light, and he sees the light going at the speed of light. But this guy looks at that light, and he knows that light just came out of that spaceship, right? Because he can see the spaceship shining the light. And he looks at the light, and he says, dang, that light is going 1.9 times the speed of light. No! Everybody sees this light and that light going at the speed of light because that's the speed at which light goes. That's why we call it light speed. So, fundamentally, our understanding of space and time must be flawed. You don't know anything about space. I guess I should write that word too. Or time. You don't know anything about them. But, whoa, 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 I thought we did, right? Let's get that train back. Seriously, we know a lot about space and time because we can confirm that all this is true. You got a guy on uh, the train and he throws a baseball and it is going 34 meters per second as seen by this guy and it's going 17 meters per second as seen by this guy right here. All of that is reasonable. So somehow Einstein has this strange task of making this Rev <laughs> this shocking, shocking observation. It's really just a thought in his head in 1905. That's the profound thing. He's just thinking that it probably works out. And then he runs a whole bunch of mathematics. It's rather simple mathematics and we'll be able to do a lot of it. But he says in 1905 that we're gonna have to get this stuff, this special relativity, to reduce to regular Newtonian mechanics He has to get special relativity to reduce to Newtonian me mechanics at low speeds. Wow, so this funky stuff only gets funky when we're talking about high speed things. Let me just shake one more bit of understanding that you thought you had about the world. This guy is clearly moving at 0.9 C, but if you're on this rocket ship, you know, based on the first equivalence statement, that you can't do any experiment, like you draw the blinds and you're going at exactly 0.9 C and you're not bouncing around at all, it's space, right? What are you gonna resist against? Okay, so if you're doing experiments in here and you're in the bathroom, let's say, in the spaceship and all the lights are off, you can't tell that you're going 0.9 C. So frankly, you begin to question, wait a second, maybe I'm still, and you throw a ball up into the air and it comes back and you catch it and nothing weird's going on. So you think, no, I'm still and that guy is moving. At this point, you're back to the fat walrus. Who the heck is fat here? Who's moving? Who's still? There is no absolute reference frame for measurement of motion in the universe. I'm sorry, it seems like everything is relative, suckas.